<laughs> Here we are. Um, greetings, everybody that's uh, uh, here on time, bang on uh, 8 o'clock, and um, from well before, as uh, far as we can uh, make out. Um, yeah, Indeed. so glad to see you as ever. I'll probably explain, you know, when we actually go live a bit later on. Um, thank you for turning up, because, of course, it's uh, not usual that Rupert and I do two lives within the space of a week. You know, the last time was last Thursday. Um, we'll explain a bit further uh, when we go live proper. Uh, what, what, in four that. minutes, yeah. 20 seconds? Yes. In four minutes, 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, no, it's appreciated you being here, um, because, you know, it's not every... You can't give up give up every Thursday night for to be live with the prehistory guys. You need some, you know. Uh, yes, yes. Some some of you need to get out more. I wondered if you were going to. <laughs> oh, uh, hi there. Well, uh, greetings, Kev. Um, <clears throat> are you talking? Uh, yesterday's moot blew my your brains. Uh, Cradle of Humanity is near Galilee over 20,000 years ago. Absolutely something like that. You know, that's, a, that's where the evidence yeah. is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It could, it, it, uh, yeah. Even 22. Um, yeah, it's all, uh, all good yeah. stuff. Anyway, good to see you, Kevin. Yeah. Um, hope you're doing well, by the way. Uh, Andy Wickham, you're very welcome. Thank you for reminding people to click the like button. <laughs> Saves us a job. <laughs> Uh, hello, Joe from Bristol. Uh, very welcome. Um, hello, Marianne. Manic fingers. Um, very good evening to you. You were with us last Thursday, I remember. Faye, hello there. Red yeah. Wing. Um, Stephen. Um, oh, right. Okay. Well caught, Stephen. Hope you enjoy. Um, as, as we'll probably say, there's no reason to absolutely to hang around. We will. We're, this is just an open-ended, you know, uh, um, yes. uh, chat, uh, really. If if you get bored, you can yes. you can go away. Hello, uh, hello, everybody else. Hello, Dualman. Hello, David. Just just so many of you. Oh, <laughs> David Potter. For those of you that don't know, David Potter yes. is uh, uh, is uh, 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 a right hand man to us. Yes, he is. One of our very one of our very valuable admins. Uh, and yeah. David says I'm at work getting paid to watch. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, Can't say that's the kind of job we like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for ex your excitement, Hyper Bum Fuzzle. Always good to see. Um, can yeah. I just check before we do go live? Last time there was a bit of a, um, a, 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 a note that. Rupert's audio stream was louder than mine. Um, mm. Could you give us the, um, an, an idea of how the balance is uh, this time around? Yes, let's, if you don't let's mind, just know somebody. If that sounds. Uh, yeah. um. <clears throat> I'll never leave you. <laughs> it's great that you're from all over the place. So, Catherine in Ohio, Eric in Texas. Yeah. Yep. 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 Fantastic. Uh, oh, Astrid in Clare. Well, we'll be uh, driving into Clare. What is it on weekend? On the Sunday, we'll be driving into Clare, won't we? Uh, um, is it Sunday? It might be Sunday. It might be Sunday. Up to Limerick, up uh, to Pulnebrone, yeah. and then on yeah. to Sligo. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Tegan. Very good to see you, uh, and welcome to the live uh, show. The Netherlands yeah, here. Heather too. First time here. Hello, mm -hmm. um, uh, this weekend, yes, yes Astrid. Uh, we'll be in a coach with them, um, uh, uh, with some other people. We, <laughs> Rachel we from Eugene, yeah. Oregon. Rachel, we've got some some of your neighbours coming on the tour with us. Well, we? indeed. I'm wondering if you know uh, yeah. Rick and the um, uh, Archaeological Institute um, and the um, Archaeology Film Festival. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's not far from us uh, actually going. Like, well, we are already, but you know, the countdown ending, shall we say? <laughs> yes. Uh,
As we've been saying to people in the chat during the uh, the countdown, hello again, because this doesn't happen very often, us uh, uh, doing a, a live within uh, the space of one week. Um, uh, we kind of owe an, a little bit of an explanation, don't you think, Rupert? Yeah, probably. Probably, because uh, I, I don't think we've actually done two lives in the space of a week. No. Ever, have we? Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think so. Not unless no. it's the uh, this live and the and our Patreon live for our Patreon folk, uh, which is yes, a different but thing. But public, um, yeah. uh, we haven't. Yeah. Well, it was partly because um, because we haven't done, you know, prior to last week, we actually hadn't done any um, lives for uh, a little while, and so we'd compiled all these news pieces. We would normally have, uh, you know, have been broadcasting about one way or another, and we only got through half of them last week, and so it just seemed rude not to carry on it, uh, through the rest of them. But to be honest, there's there's still loads more that that we've compiled, but um, we'll we'll get round to this in due course. But for the moment, yeah. it <clears> seems <throat> silly not to uh, just do a few more of last uh, last week's list. Absolutely. I mean, uh, my a, my concern was sort of overloading folk, but you know, <laughs> look at all the folk that are here. It's uh, it's amazing. Oh well. So well, good, I, I I work on the eternal basis that uh, that anybody can either abstain from tuning in in the first place, or turn off when they've had enough. So <laughs> all we can do is <laughs> offer it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, we've got loads of good stuff coming up um, to talk about. Uh, some stuff left over from last time, as Rupert says. But I think the other factor yeah. in this is we've got an awful lot on our plate at the moment. And as such, we haven't been able to put out uh, you know, prepared formal stuff like we uh, usually do. Uh, and we haven't uh, done the podcast uh, yet. So in this time of, uh, um, uh, yeah, our time being squeezed, it's it's easy to put this content out, to put a, a live show out, you know, because it still stays around on on YouTube and, and counts. Uh, and, yeah, it just it's always a good opportunity to interact with folk and see where you are mm. and where you are and how you are and and uh, and get your feedback and uh, input to uh, what we're thinking about and stuff so um oh where are you gone <laughs> oh, it's all right. I was, uh, yes don't worry <laughs> i was just re readjusting myself anything else you'd like to say rupert before we actually begin on the good stuff uh, you know about um, um I, uh, do you know what i don't think so other than the normal housekeeping of um yeah uh those of you that are, are, are new here because we've seen there's a couple of you who have not been before um that um obviously as you're on the youtube channel you know that there's quite a lot on there to see if you like the other stuff that we do have a look at our Patreon page because there's a load of stuff on there that is specifically for patrons. It doesn't go um, mm. anywhere else. It's unique to uh, the Patreon channel. Um, and and also, um, if you don't know our big project, one of the things that, you know, I say we've got a lot on our plate. Well, the biggest thing we have on our plate at the moment, apart from the island tour, which is coming up next week, um, is uh, we're doing our series, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge, which we're crowdfunding for. We've raised enough money to do the first set of filming. Um, so uh, so that's all going ahead. And the, the uh, fundraising carries on on our Buy Me A Coffee page. And any money going into that now um, is funding for the second tranche of filming that'll be next spring mm. uh so uh, so yeah if you want to help us with that then uh, always much appreciated yeah. i can't think of anything else immediately well yeah. folk will have noticed but you know the links to both uh, opportunities funding opportunities are down in the description below <laughs> yes rupert could you just yes. uh, angle your camera a bit downwards because you, you're looking a bit low in the making yeah in the frame, that's a bit better. Yeah. Sort of equal us up. 
All right, cool. Um, yes, Craig says, you are a tour you know? of the prehistoric world. No, yeah, tell us uh, about it. Who was saying that they were in Car- Tegan? I was in Karnak a few weeks ago. Uh, oh, wait. At, yeah, and you said, um, oh, dear, have I lost it? Um, I thought you said also that you were at um, in... Um, Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the, above the Paviland Cave on the Gower. The last time you 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 were, uh, oh no, you're camping above Paviland Cave on the Gower now. That's is, we're talking about Kate. <laughs> last time I caught you were uh, you well, were camping at Karnak. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Yeah, I'm yeah, impressed. Yeah. That's very good. Well, well, I hope the weather's smiling on in uh, in Wales. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been challenged to talk about the Paviland lady, who isn't a lady, of course. Who isn't a lady? No. Yes. Well, actually, it's. Do you know what? It's. It's funny from a completely different point of view. It's interesting that you would raise that because uh, one of the items we're talking about uh, today, uh, uh, there's a lot of red ochre involved, isn't there? Yeah. Um, yeah, but um, mm. yeah, not quite. Yes. For so long ago but nevertheless yeah it keeps no, coming up doesn't it no, the, indeed uh, the... indeed but there's a, the but yeah there's a connection anyway uh yeah there you go no i uh, i can't think of anything else immediately i'll say hello helen uh nice to see you looking forward to seeing you next week um yeah 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 oh yes uh, indeed yeah. uh jez good evening to you sir right okay so uh, is it on to our first uh you know our first talking point yeah, where do you want to start? Uh, well, I thought um, I thought we should start with um, uh, this one actually. So uh, yeah. I put it early yeah. on because okay. I think I we'll can't... probably talk for a, quite a while yeah. about this one. <laughs> um, I, I yes. don't know. Anyway, do you want to start off with this, Rupert? You can say no. Um... <laughs> Uh, I, well, I, I, okay, it's just it's where to start with this. Uh, uh, so there's a, a it, we're talking about Ireland here, and uh, what they've found um, is a piece of reindeer bone which has uh, which shows uh, signs of butchery. Uh, Can and I? It was found in a cave. Yes. Go on. Then you just start. interrupt. Well, the the eagle-eyed amongst you <laughs> will have seen the date on the top of this uh, this article, which is eighteenth of April, yes. two thousand and twenty-one. However, it did yeah. come up in my timeline very recently, and um, mm. we're pleased to be talking about this one because we'll be driving within a mile or two of this location as we drive up. Uh, uh, towards County Clare, yeah, uh, on yes, Sunday. Yes, we, we, we won't be visiting it, though. It's no, a hike. I don't think there's anything to um, visit, really, but anyway. Uh, uh, no, probably not, but... Um, Sorry, uh, I just thought that historically, was... That's, that's all right. Historically, this cave was known for um, mammoth remains, um, but uh, but this piece of reindeer bone uh, was uh, was found in there, and it just completely overturned. I say we. I don't mean we too. I mean your microphone. Everybody. Sorry, I will. Your microphone has done that thing of swapping over to the this internal. Is the this is uh, the <laughs> the wonders yeah. of live TV. You talk while I reset. It, indeed, no, Rupert's abs- absolutely right. The the extraordinary thing about this, actually, the the bones that came out of Mammoth Cave um, was uh, actually came out of there um, 1904 between 19 sometime between 1904 and 1912. So the bones have actually been out of the cave for, for quite some time. The I, I don't I'll speak about the you know what's remarkable about. You know, coming across a bit of reindeer bone that's got a incised bit in it that tells us that humans were alive at the time. Um, but in a nutshell, the headline of this is this one piece of reindeer bone put the earliest date for humans uh, uh, on the island of Ireland um, back about twenty thousand years. Previously, 
Uh, previous to this, the uh, date that had been given for the earliest occupation in the Mesolithic was about uh, 10,500 years ago. And that had been given by uh, a, a, the uh, patella bone of a bear that had come out of a cave. Actually, strange enough, Rupert, we'll be passing through by that one on the same journey. On on Sunday, I think it's I think it's Sunday, maybe Monday. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll be pointing out of a moving coach window. Yes, indeed. Your microphone is still on the uh, your. Uh, it, you're joking. It seems no. to be functioning normally for me. No. Right. Um, I think you okay. might have to I'm go out and come do, back in again. I'm going to have to go and come again. Yes. The glory yeah. of okay. Tech. Uh, bear, bear with me, folks. I'll be back in a minute. See you in a second. I'll entertain the, the, the folks. Uh, yeah, the bear patella in the cave, uh, which uh, again on the same road we're going to be driving past it. How uh, how can how does that happen? Um, which is uh, interesting. How I mean, this is a bit of a sidebar to what we're talking about. Is that um, uh, textbooks, archaeology books that you can get, which are seemingly uh, up to uh, date um, with uh, current uh, thinking. I've got a book here, only recently acquired, uh, The uh, Prehistoric Archaeology of Ireland. Uh, what's it, John Waddell there? Now, this edition goes back uh, some, some time, but that is an edition printed in um, uh, 2022, last year. And it still got, it still gives... The um, bear patella, I can show you the page with its scratchings on it, still gives the bear patella uh, as the earliest indication of humans in um, Ireland at uh, uh, 10,500 years uh, BC. Let me, let me hear your voice, Rupert. I, I presume you've... Uh, can, you, can you hear my voice? Tell me it's all right. I now. can hear your voice, but it's the wrong microphone. I'm so sorry to, to tell you. <clears throat> right. Well, it says it's the right one. I shall. I don't know what to do about that. Uh, bear with no, me no, no. while I have a fiddle. Uh, while I'm doing that, thank you very much, uh, Jim. That's very, oh. very kind of you. Bless you, Jim. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You, uh, we, uh, we shall enjoy a nice pint. Shall we do that, Rupert? On Jim. I think we, we shall raise, raise a glass uh, in <laughs> in a Dublin pub or court or somewhere. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> uh, any any joy over there? Right. Um, well, I'm hoping so. Is that better? No. No. Mm. We'll have to deal with it. Uh, we'll just have to go with it, I'm afraid. We can hear you. It's fine. It's um, just not the normal quality, beyond, that's all. Beyond the... Um... um I'll turn you up a little bit. Um, Astrid uh, says, I thought yes. they found a ra reindeer bone in Clare recently. Um, uh, cork. Oh, well, I, I, mm, I don't think it's in Clare, is it? Um, this is north of Cork uh, on the way, so I, I can't remember. I don't know which county we're still in. Um, I we're talking with this. about the same thing here. Oh, yes, we're absolutely talking about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, it, how, okay. So, how quiet am I? You're not quiet um, terribly. It's just not it's good just, just horrible quality. Yeah. I don't understand why that can be. Uh, it just it just has a mind of its own. It seems. <clears throat> well, and I wouldn't. Time this is no, but I, I don't won't be able to hear you for a second. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, the reindeer bone. Uh, I think the. Let me just uh, uh, read for a moment. Um, the reindeer bone fragment uncovered in the cave contains a revelation set to alter the understanding of Irish human history. I mean, it's that deep. The bone, a hind leg reindeer femur, establishes human activity in Ireland 33,000 years ago, more than 20,000 years earlier than previously thought. Um, goes on to say... Uh, about Mammoth Cave and when when it was um, um, excavated. 
I, I can't speak enough about the repercussions for this, for uh, the occupation of Ireland, because nobody knows, I don't think anybody knows at that stage, how well I the island of Ireland was connected to um, to Britain or the ma mainland, um, put it how you will. I'm glad you said uh, that, because that's what I was going to raise, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, what exactly the climate w would have been, because this is before the last um, Ice Age maximum, isn't it? The last glacial maximum, yeah. thirty-three thousand years ago. Um, yeah. So we can't speak to that much more because I think that comes up against the things of our uh, ignorance. But just take it at face or, value. Or, or, although it is fair to say, though, that uh, that even going back twenty thousand years, that uh, that um, Ireland and the rest of the British Isles was still very firmly one land mass that connected right across Dogland and, and on. So yeah. um, so it's not as if people were crossing water to get yeah. to uh, Ireland. It wasn't an island. Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> an island. It wasn't an island at the time. How's my microphone now? Rubbish. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but um, here's that femur. And in that blue circle, obviously, is the uh, cut mark that tells you that this reindeer um, has been butchered. Now, mm. on the face of it, you think, well, duh, you know, that's an, an easy thing. But this is happening, uh, what, how many years, you know, since uh, 1912? Oh, you, have you have you stopped hearing me? How, how many years is that since nineteen twelve? Uh, over a hundred. Over well, yeah, a hundred and eleven. Yeah. So actually, detecting a, a cut mark on a piece of uh, reindeer femur speaks to somebody doing extraordinary work, and I think if I show you this, you get an idea. Of what's going on here? That is Dr. Ruth Carden, a zoo archaeologist um, uh, at um, uh, where is she? A uh, School of Archaeology. Uh, the uh, she's an adjunct research fellow with the School of Archaeology, UCD. Um, she explained that the bone remains were shipped to the National Museum of Ireland following excavation and were stored in boxes on shelves for more than one hundred years. The story of the discovery of the reindeer bone fragment was revealed as part of the Burren, Heart of Stone documentary um, by uh, La Hinch-based filmmaker Katrina Costello. Now, if you get a chance, watch that. I'll probably come back to that. The Burren, Heart of Stone. Wonderful, wonderful documentary film. Great film, yeah. In 2008, Dr. Carden commenced work on a large personal research project involving antiquarian collections of animal skeletal remains. She set to work examining 60,000 bone fragments that were excavated from at least 11 limestone caves across Ireland in the late 1800s to, to mid-1900s. She says this bone just changed Irish human history. We have humans coming into Ireland 33,000 years ago, which changes everything for Ireland and changes northwestern Europe as a whole, Dr. Carden said. Now, she'll never blow her own um, uh, whistle, I should think, her own trumpet as far as what goes. But that picture you can see there tells an incredible story. Because all round of the <laughs> see those plastic bags will be full of bone fragments from all over Ireland. Got a few in front of her in the film. This is a still from the film. She's holding the actual reindeer femur um, in her hand uh, there. The point is, what if she'd missed that? Oh, <laughs> yeah. The point is, it's a, another case, I'm using this as a, you know, not to talk about reindeer bone, but another case of hats off to people that do the work. It's yeah. no mean thing to, you know, have extraordinary discoveries like, like that. It is the sheer 60,000 fragments, fragments of bone, you know, from so many places, and she manages to find that one. You know, 
I mean, mm. it's great that the stuff has been archived properly so she know exact, knew exactly where it came from. But goodness me. Yeah? It, so, it is astonishing. Uh, I, I think uh, when you... Uh, uh, when you look at the numbers of, say, flint fragments in assemblages, that um, uh, what was the name of the uh, uh, the uh, woman who was working with Mike Parker Pearson? Uh, that she, uh, it, it, I can't remember how long oh. it took her, but she worked through half a million flint fragments, um, bone, no, burnt, burnt bone, bone fragments, and burnt bone fragments. I mean, it's just yeah, yeah. Mind-boggling uh, the the dedication to, mm. uh, <laughs> to just cataloging everything is staggering, absolutely staggering. I couldn't do it. I just yeah, couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, some blue people are reporting buffering. Um, well, hopefully it'll uh, catch up. I don't think there's anything we can do about uh, that. It's it's funny. It hasn't been this dodgy for um, uh, for quite a while. I'm, yeah. I'm tempted. To, I'm tempted to say, in due course, um, you could uh, you could run a commercial of uh, <laughs> of, of Gebekli Tepe Stonehenge while I yeah. reboot and try to get my uh, sound back in order. It's really quite odd. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, uh, give us a few thumbs up. Are we back online? Are we stopped um, uh, um, a bit fragmented? Oh, well, we have, there's nothing we can do. We have to uh, 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 press on yeah. r regardless. Uh, I hope uh, yeah. the point was made, though, uh, about, uh, well, the dedication of, uh, of unsung heroes in the back room sorting through uh, millions and bits and, of pieces. Uh, to there are many. make earth-shattering, you know, earth-moving uh, discoveries like that. Anything else we can say about that, Rupert? Uh, no, no, no. I think uh, you know that's uh, that, that's it. Said, isn't it? Really, the fact that so, so so tiny a detail can completely overturn everything that everybody thought they knew. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and it does really. Uh, illustrate just how important it is to be vigilant about detail mm. and not not hang your hat on uh, on things that might not be a hundred percent. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. a fantastic discovery. Okay, um, let's move on, shall we? Uh, let me show you uh, this. Um, uh, did you want to say now, something? How's my no. sound? Because yeah, Missy no. Hearty said uh, that sound sound is back and my sound is better. So uh, oh. I don't know. Seems no, very I don't strange. think so. No, you're still no? very okay. echoey. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there we go. Tech. Um, yeah, going over to um, Israel this time and the discovery yeah. of an ancient city gate, oldest found in mm. Israel, dating back uh, five thousand. 500 years. Um, did you want to speak about this, Rupert? Uh, you know what? I think it's it, the, uh, in many ways, this is, it's, it's kind of marginally exciting. I mean, there, there is so much archaeology being done in uh, what was the Levant. Uh, so, uh, so all, all the way around from, uh, from Anatolia on down to Egypt, if you take that part of, uh, so that's the Levant as opposed to, you know, so it's just a section of the Fertile Crescent. And there is so much archaeology being done and so many discoveries being made. Um, mm. And this they've, uh, they've found, so as Mike just said, five and a half thousand years old, it's a city gate. And uh, they've actually excavated. So there's a, a the gate itself. It's it's not very tall. It's only about uh, well, a meter and a half, four foot something tall, with uh, mm. with two larger uh, flanker stones on either side of the gate. Well, I think the assumption is that there would have been you know uh, 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 <coughs> bricks and uh, and stuff above it. You know that it wasn't. Yeah, uh, that, yeah, yeah. So it's but this, this is what they've uh, this is what they've uh, they've found. Yeah. And it's the fact that uh, that this is a part of the world that has been uh, it's been home to cities 
for thousands of years throughout this whole region. And uh, it's just, it's exciting when they find something, you know, from, from another period here. So specifically five and a half thousand years ago, I think everything that we know about uh, this particular part of Israel, you know, most of it seems to be a little bit later than that. So it's nice when they push something back uh, here. There's, yeah. there's a nice aerial shot of it. Uh, so I haven't got my I've dates... Got the- I haven't got my dates nailed down about the development right. of the cities over t- further east in the, um, you know, in, in between the Euphrates and uh, um, uh, over in Sumer and Mesopotamia, further yes. over, over the t- to the east uh, between the yeah. Euphrates and the Tigris, um, which led to the great uh, cities there. I haven't got my times right on that. But um it seems um what is the date there uh it says it says tell irani which is where this is has been part of ongoing excavations since the 1950s the city stood for centuries but it appears to have been at its peak during the early bronze age around 303 um 3330 yeah yeah which is it's always a good idea to put these things in context. You know, that's talking 500 years before the Sarsen Stones going up at Stonehenge. Yeah. You know. Um, just, <laughs> just keeping it real, well, that's all. <laughs> oh, uh, well, yeah, just the, the perspectives. Well, we we just, we kind of, we, we throw these numbers around, don't we? This yeah. is... You know, however many years of BCE or, or whatever, and and it's amazing how in your head you know you'll you'll, you'll compress a thousand years as if it's nothing, yeah. um, when uh, when clearly it's it's a vast period of time uh, when you're looking at, at human development. So mm. uh, the the very fact that, that you know everything we know about how uh, in, even you know farming as it moved. Uh, West. Um, that's in fact, there's another interesting article that we'll be talking about shortly. Um, yeah. That that so talking about cities in uh, in the Fertile Crescent, it's not a surprise that there would have been so many, uh, you know, well established yeah. uh, yeah. cultures and civilizations uh, in that yeah. region. Do yeah. you remember when we were talking about the Sumerian? Um, oh, crikey! <laughs> Senior moment number one. Um, <laughs> uh, what was the name of the Sumerian city? I have acquired a special a month ago. <laughs> it is. It's the Senior Moment Bell. Thank you yeah. so much. There will be many of them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was the name of the city that we were talking about um, uh, a little while ago? Uh, oh, uh, with, with the with the pub. What looks like a, a pub in in the yeah. city. I can't remember which city it was. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it would have been one okay, of so seven. You're having a senior moment as well. Oh, all right. Excellent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, uh, that was a little bit later. Um, but even yeah. so, you're, you're still talking about... A little bit. You're probably uh, talking about a thousand years. There you see, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but the point is that when you're talking about this level of culture and, and the sophistication of, uh, of you know, all the buildings that, mm. uh, that they had in these cities, these were very, very well-advanced peoples, Um uh, yeah, it's that really. It's just every time they they make an extra digging. Sorry, my cat's just come to join us. Come on. In. If but your yeah. cat can fix um, your microphone, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I know. Can you? He's, he's a tech wizard tonight, though. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, this it's another one of those watch these space watch this space 
um, pieces of excavation, really, because mm -mm. Uh, it, it's interesting. I, I can't see. Um, I can't see what what we're showing to the world at the same time as I can uh, look at my own references at the moment. So oh, I, don't I see. Know. Did, uh, did, did, just, did, well, well, did, I'm not showing the text at the moment. Do you want to see the text? Uh, no, no, no. It was uh, it was whether um, people had seen the aerial shot looking down on the excavation. Um, it's an elevated shot, and I think you mean this one, uh, yeah, which uh, shows the Absolutely. entrance into, you know, what seems to be a quite a narrow alleyway. And the questions that kind of come up for me, Rupert, and are uh, highlighted in the article itself, uh, is that you've got one gate uh, which speaks to people, you know, a restricted, a del very deliberately restricted entrance to something that is quite fortified. Um, yes. So you're wondering, you know, who's who is being kept out? Who's being who's allowed in? Uh, who occupies? Yeah. Who who gets to uh, trade and uh, put up their stall mm. to live within you know, these yeah. walls? Who doesn't? And why? Mm. Why uh, the uh, What's, what is the danger? What is the threat uh, that yeah. uh, a, a very narrow it, city gate has it, to be there to the, really strictly raises, limit numbers? It raises so many questions, though, doesn't it? Because uh, yeah. you know it's it's very em emphatically stated as a city, um, and yet the, the you know you can only ever excavate as much as uh, as you know as you can, and so you know mm. what is the extent? How many hectares, if you like, uh, is this city? How big yeah. is the city? Because it, uh, if it's uh, if it's a sizable city, and we know that there were plenty of cities in this region in the Fertile Crescent, well, uh, out of all the parts of it that they have not yet excavated, how many other gates are there? How many gates into the city may they seem there to be, have been? They seem. Um, I mean, I think that the uh, the excavations have been extensive and been on going on for many years. Yes. So I think their discovery of this is quite a quite a thing for well, them. Well, clearly, and, it's uh, a significant the implication thing, but, is uh, that uh, this is the uh, uh, only gate. I, you know, I, I, but that's the point, isn't it? I just I raised the question because yeah. uh, because okay, it, if it's if it's the only one that they found. I still question whether you could have had a city of any size and it only had one gate. Um, one narrow gate. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah. But obviously um, the, the, the principle of restriction is there, you know, big time. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like it says in the article, it is possible that all passers-by, traders or enemies who wanted to enter the city had to pass through this impressive gate. The gate not only defended the settlement, but also conveyed the message that one was entering an important, strong settlement that was well organized politically, socially, and economically, said Martin David Pasternak, an early Bronze Age archaeologist with the IAA. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's what we get from... Uh, why is it that ILF, IFL science, I can't get rid of all the, these random... What seem to be random pictures, nice, nice pictures, but it's very hard to uh, get rid of them. Yeah. Anyway, very pretty. I'll tell you what. The uh, you flick past um, uh, one of those pictures. There was uh, three new species of leaf insect discovered. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, folks. I, I, what am I like? <laughs> I forgot that we had Rupert Soskin uh, with us. Welcome, uh, entomologist. Uh, yes, tell us about these uh, the insects. Indian, oh, it's just it's it's one of the most fantastic uh, bits of, uh, of camouflage in the insect world that there is. Isn't and these great? are three new species that they've only just found. Look yeah. at I know, amazing, isn't it? Do you know what? I used to uh, I, I used to rear them when I was photographing their life cycles and recording uh, changes and what have you. And uh, and I I have a very big tank where can you see it down there? It's down the other oh, end of the studio. Oh, it's, I've got a big tank down there. Um, there you can see the uh, big so, tank. You can see it in the background behind me. And uh, and so that was full of uh, you know when you're rearing critters from around the world, obviously you have to import the right food plants for them and what have you. And uh, I, I'm not kidding. I I had twenty or so of them uh, in the tank. 
and uh, and because you're checking on a daily basis and i can't tell you how many times that i just couldn't see them i couldn't see them at all just counting and counting and counting no do that one again and they're completely invisible yeah <laughs> standing with bugs, bugs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is a book <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, yes, yes, yes. Go buy my book, Metamorphosis. Uh, <laughs> yes, go and buy it. Put uh, 50p in my pocket. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Let's. Oh, um, uh, yes. Let's move along a bit. Here we go. Ancient genomes suggest farming in Africa was ignited by overseas migrants from Iberia 7,400 years ago. At first yes. glance, um, that's a pretty random photograph. I don't know. Oh, uh, is that the cave of where they found? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. This, this this is not illustratable, really. Yeah, but on the face of it, the 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 uh, the title doesn't look that um, thrilling. Um, but uh, and I think probably maybe we might have passed it by had we not been turning our minds, Rupert and I, to. Um, uh, to the, that migration pattern um, mm. from folk moving across from Anatolia, across the Mediterranean, and, and which directions um, they were going this way and the other. This study tells us that uh, from a genetic point of view, that round about 7,400 years ago, um, that uh, the... Uh, uh, hunter-gatherer, we'll call them that for convenience sake, uh, in who would have been in the Mesolithic uh, still, were not replaced in the same way that uh, uh, farmers replaced the uh, hunter-gatherer population in other parts of Europe, um, mm. but seemingly had their own enclaves, but didn't push, com push the um, hunter-gatherer population completely out. So... Mm. Uh, the farmers came into um, into Morocco uh, and st stayed there, um, and that was a strand of people that were coming from the north, across from Iberia, maybe across the Strait of Gibraltar. Uh, who who knows? You know, and that is about the right kind of time when you know just after farmers have gone into uh, uh, Iberia and are already constructing. Uh, quite impressive megalithic sites uh, uh, along the coast, that coast of the Mediterranean. <clears throat> um, yeah, on the, on the Spanish coast along there, Costa del, del Sol, uh, and mm. of course the Mediterranean uh, islands, which is interesting for a reason we'll come back to in a moment. Um, but the, later there was another group who seemed to have been coming uh, along through um, North Africa from Egypt, that also intrude into uh, this area, uh, so we don't hear so much about migrations from, you know, along the south southern edge of the Mediterranean, uh, mm. do we? So that's a very interesting one to uh, take on board. But the same thing happened. So nowadays, you know, there's a mix genetically uh, of those three strands, which is unusual because mm. in in Europe the the the, the, over, the waves of people seem to have been replacing. Uh, genetically, the people that were there before. You were mm. going to say, Rupert? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I wondered how much of this um, is due to uh, a certain bias, archaeologically speaking, in that we always talk about Africa from an anthropological point of view. So, so you know, there's the out mm, of Africa, mm. um, various hypotheses and and different timings relating to... Uh, to people, uh, you know, populating the world from Africa. We very, very rarely talk about things going back the other way, um, even though we know that Neanderthals uh, went back uh, whenever it was, getting on, what, 300 and something thousand years ago. Um, but it's that it's the archaeological thing. We We very, very rarely talk about it going back the other way. So it's interesting to have a piece of research that talks about two different strands of people migrating back into uh, North Africa, going along, as Mike said, you know, one on the uh, along the northern 
uh, coast of the uh, Mediterranean and the other coming along the, the south. So, you know, it seems that, that any which way they came out of, uh, of uh, the Levant and, uh, and moved west, but whether it's, you know, they went north or south, of the, uh, of the well, the North Mediterranean state. lot would have come out of Anatolia, uh, you know, originally, rather than the <laughs> Levant. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Moot, moot point, really, geographically. Yeah. If you're going to look at the, uh, the well, you know, the Levant is going to scrape the bottom thousand, of uh, thousand Anatolia. Thousand miles or so. Yeah. <laughs> it's not though. It's not though. Look on the map. It's not. Um, um, but uh, but he, he, you know, either way, you're you're you've got two separate peoples. Yeah. Um, over a you know a relatively short period of time historically, I mean, what are we talking about? Maximum a thousand years, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, how it, it is fascinating to have two different cultures uh, existing quite happily side by side, and one mm -hmm. of them gradually adopting the practices of the other. I was just about to say that the, the you know the, the farming practices were adopted by the other groups, um, yeah, which is yeah. something you again that you don't see in the rest of uh, Europe, where um, the, the other groups are just pushed out, you know, all sort of get absorbed the other way. They don't seem to adopt the mm. farm, farming practices. The yeah. reason I was going to say, you know, oh, this is interesting for us for another reason. Um, what is the uh, huge stone circle megalithic site in Morocco? Um, don't press that bell yet. <laughs> You're reaching for a book. That's cheating. I'm not reaching for a book. I'm looking at it because I did have... God, everything's going so slow tonight. I, do you know what? I bet you I filed it. I have. Yeah. It. It, was it? Um, M uh, oh, Masura. Masura. Well done. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> it, was it was close. Um, it was close. <laughs> um, yes, Masura uh, in Morocco, and it is. It's huge. Um, yeah. Sorry. Why did you bring that up? Well, because th that that incursion of Neolithic farmers with mm. you know who are already begun uh you know big me megalithic structures i mean i'm uh, talking about uh, dom and domenga for in for instance uh, you know uh, mm. just above uh, malaga we'll probably mention yeah. that again later on um you know so now this rather enigmatic and uh, uh, sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, parentless <laughs> what looks like a Neolithic mound in Morocco mm, suddenly uh, takes on a bit of resonance. Could it be that uh, mm. that actually belongs uh, in the, from, from the Neolithic? Do you know, uh, the, there's something that we, it, we should probably say in relation to that, because um, whilst it's, uh, you know, it, it's often argued that, that the culture wouldn't have spread south uh, from Europe, so that might not be connected. But the, the, we should never forget that the vast majority of stone circles and the like have never been properly dated anyway. A lot of it is uh, no, is right. based on yeah. uh, on conjecture. Uh, so uh, so yeah, it's, it it would it would be lovely if if many of these sites could be accurately dated, but it's just almost impossible to do. Um, yeah. to, to just see a huge shout out to Ruben Berlin and Andy McGeekin, who um, straight upon each other um, for guys bun bundles you. cash. Thank you very very much. Your money will be well spent. Yeah. Um, thank you. <clears throat> much appreciated. Um, which um, actually makes me notice that um, uh, that Elaine. Uh, 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 knew that it was Masura. Masura, yeah. Uh, yep. uh, yes. Uh, so, well done. <laughs> Just saying. I'll, 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 I'll give her a ting for being, for actually having a memory. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, yes. If we forget something, um, we get a ting, and if you, you remind yes, us If us you remember something, something yeah, then you <laughs> well, Or maybe I'll get an in, uh, a, a different instrument altogether. Mm. 
maybe maybe uh, maybe, uh, maybe a duck bone flute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So long as you can play a kazoo, probably. Um, yeah. no, anything <laughs> as long as it doesn't require too much effort, mm. I'm fine. <laughs> Yeah. Anything um, anything you want to say more about that? Because I think we've carried the essence uh, of, of that. We have carried the essence. I, and I think the the important thing, uh, for me, the important thing about this uh, finding specifically is that it, it's that detail that they have shown that these people, so the hunter-gatherers and the farmers, <clears throat> We're living side by side for quite some period of time, gradually exchanging uh, practices. And what? when you look at um, the movement of farming, particularly, you know, what we're going to be looking at in um, uh, Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge, that when you look at the movements of cultural practices um, uh, spreading west, that just because it's not slapping you in the face in the archaeological record, um, mm, mm. you know that there is there is so much potential within that history for um, for the positive coming together of cultures, not um, necessarily of. Well, well um, Marco just asked: Is there evidence that there was already trade with the area, um, and it's uh, seven thousand five hundred years ago? <coughs> I think it's. Um, yeah, and uh, I haven't heard of evidence, but I'm almost, you know, it'd be very, very unlikely that there uh, wasn't, because this is one, mm. one thing that comes up time and time again, that where um, farmers have ventured out into new lands, they've travelled routes that have already been established uh, by yeah. trade um, with yeah. um, Mesolithic... I mean, we've just got to find another word, the hunter-gatherers. It really, really doesn't. I mean, it's crazy. But we're it still is, using the hunter-gatherer it, moniker uh, for uh, these uh, people. So, yes. Uh, we'll um, just call them farmers well, and non-farmers, shall we? Uh, well, that's more honest. Yeah. Uh, <clears> and, <throat> and more descriptive. Um, <laughs> certainly, I mean, you know, a lot of you will have heard us bang on about it you know that just mm, the mm. term hunter gatherer does not by any stretch of the imagination yeah. mean primitive and yet people always seem to interpret it that way yeah uh, as we'll see mean. later on uh, the networks in mesolithic society uh, were far more uh, established than we would give them mm. credit so i would i think it's it's also it's important to bear in mind here that uh, that whilst this is old it's not hugely old. We're talking about um, you know seven and a half thousand years ago. Now, yeah. seven and a half thousand years ago, y y you can point towards any number of trade routes, um, exchanges of different um, items going back over that period of time. Uh, mm. Particularly obsidian, which was uh, yeah. traded and exchanged over vast regions. Um, I mean, even one of my favourite ones is the obsidian cache that they found in Siberia, that when they did the petrology on it, uh, and I'm talking about, was it 16,000 years ago, Mike? I mean, it's something, it's enormous. It, it's it's something like that length of time. Um, yeah. And when they did the petrology on it, they found that the, uh, the obsidian actually came from a thousand miles away from where it was found. Um, so if going back over that period of time that people were moving uh, stuff those distances, obviously we don't know how it travelled th that thousand miles. We don't know. Um, but, but the thing is that people have been exchanging items uh, and materials over that sort of length of time. Hmm. So to, uh, to have... Um, a coming together of people here seven and a half thousand years ago, uh, it, particularly when it's North Africa. It's not like yeah. we're talking about them traipsing, uh, you know, way south down through the Congo and Lord knows what. Sure. Um, you know, the, 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 this is, uh, uh, you know, that 
okay, it's we're not getting into dynastic Egypt, but um, but it's still you know you're still talking about hugely sophisticated people at that period in time. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say it's almost a given that uh, there are trade routes. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I mean the short answer is if uh, I was a betting man, I'd say um, yeah, definitely that, that's. Uh, Going mm. through established trade routes, um, there was a couple of things uh, in the chat. Yes, Dion, it's more like one of those old bike bells that uh, ran <laughs> on the yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or, or. Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what of the Denisovans? Well, they're long gone by now. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a sort of out of our remit, really. Uh, Eric says pre agriculturalists is a good uh, uh, good term. Uh, that's not a bad term, is, especially for those managing um, the resources. Uh, yeah. Do, 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 do. Yes. Uh, Andy. Andy then says Mesolithic land management evolved into Neolithic farming. Well, that's a talking point because that's not the way the evidence and the genetic evidence seems to be pointing these days. <coughs> no. I don't know if, um, um, whereabouts in the world, if you're talking about anywhere particularly uh, in the world where that uh, it happened that way around, uh, uh, Andy, or you know, if you're talking about a particular um, study somewhere, uh, get back to us. <clears throat> Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, Eric says Native Americans did a considerable amount of resource management and some cultures were heavily reliant on, on agriculture. Um, so, yes, yes I, I, if you're thinking from uh, an American point of view, then that uh, maybe has more um, yeah, validity to it. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a sad thing that... Um, that the archaeology in the Americas is um, is so understated in comparison, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, largely because a lot of the dating is difficult because where you've got cultures, uh, you know, building on top of previous cultures, so, you, you know, you date the more recent stuff. I mean, take any of the Inca uh, uh, remains, if you like, the Inca settlements, and it's... Um, well, okay, it's, it's there, there's not uh, there's not general consensus, but there's uh, a lot of uh, evidence to to say that some of the uh, some of the huge megalithic sites like Sacsayhuaman, for example, actually predate the Incas by a long way. It's just the Incas were the last people to um, to be inhabiting those places, and and if that's the case, you know, we we don't have any solid dating for when those places were actually constructed. We know that we've got dates for when they were repaired. It's not the same thing. Um, so, yeah, it would be nice to get some solid dating on a lot of the uh, uh, American and South American sites. Mm. Really would. Mm. Mm. Stuart suggests how about uh, pre-cultivation, which has got some yeah. legs, but I think you fall in, probably fall into a trap there because there's a very grey area. Uh, especially as we've been develop, delving back into uh, deep prehistory of the Levant and uh, the pre uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the not the uh, Mesolithic but the Epipaleolithic uh, times, and people were not uh, um, not doing agriculture, but they were certainly managing their environment. In such mm. a way that enabled them to to settle down. It wasn't agriculture. There's long. That's still a long way off. But we're talking about <clears throat> um, where twenty thousand BC, aren't we? By the yeah, night, twenty thousand years ago. And yeah. um, uh, you know, there's there's certainly evidence that uh, uh, at least in, uh, in in one significant area uh, over uh, over there that uh, that people were harvesting wild uh, cereals in sufficient quantities that they, they were doing an annual harvest and storing stuff for ages, um, you know, just because they weren't growing it themselves. So they weren't technically farming. Uh, 
you know, they were still exploiting the uh, the wild cereals and uh, wild grasses. And in fact, um, it's um, um, Ohala too, isn't it? Uh, where they they have seen, you know, in, in the archaeological record shows that these people harvested over a hundred species of plant. Uh, you know, there's, no, there's nothing primitive about this. You know, these are people who really do know how to use their environment. It's astonishing, really. Mm-hmm. And that's 20, 22,000 years ago. Mm. Um, and it says, mm. Starkar was a land management set up, but was not destroyed by a Neolithic overwrite. Um, no, I mean, Starkar uh, didn't disappear. Um, but the people that uh, uh, were doing the managing did. Um, when the mm. Neolithic uh, came in, it was a different bunch of people entirely uh, whose uh, ultimate uh, source had been uh, the Anatolia and uh, the stream that came round the Mediterranean and up the Atlantic co- um, coast. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Eric. Eric, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know when I said was and what it was in relation to. But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's still a lot of people who are uh, still harvesting and managing uh, wild uh, resources. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that in fact, you could argue, really, that uh, that if you're exploiting wild plants. That's a lot more efficient than farming, anyway, because you can you can just let nature do what it does and say thanks very much. Um, yeah. You know, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? The whole thing about farming and how energy intensive it is in comparison with being hunter gatherers. Yeah, uh, but uh, it looks like you know more and more that hunter gatherers were putting perhaps a bit more energy into things than we. May they're putting more thought, energy into but, other things, though, weren't they? Uh, that, that's well, the point. if, if there are all you, these trade routes and there are you know all these networks going on, you know that uh, it, uh, it, it takes yes. something other than doing the hunting and the gathering to spend the time making contact with people and uh, passing yeah. things along. Yeah, um, yeah, hard okay. to imagine. Reckless no arts. till farming. That's good. I like that, Leon. No till <laughs> farming. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Reckless asks, trade routes or raiding stroke looting routes, can we see evidence for either? Um, no, I don't think so. I can tell you what, you bet your bottom dollar though, you got uh, trading, whichever date, pick your date anywhere, and you'd have pirates. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Guaranteed. I, Brigands. Yeah. Yeah, the the missing bit for me is seeing you know this kind of boats that uh, were being sailed across the Mediterranean uh, and thereabouts at that time. Uh, how big were they? How many people did it take? What sort of sails did they have? And those kinds of things. Uh, I'm yeah. just scrolling down. And, uh, um, I'm scrolling down, but I still... Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, do you know, I have to answer Helena here because, do you know what, I read that with some horror. That was, uh, Helena is saying about uh, foraging for wild plants and this, uh, the associated risks. That, that It's the first time it's ever been found this week a woman had brain surgery because she had some anomaly on the brain. And when they got her head open, it was actually a living worm um, that they pulled out of her brain. And it's a type of worm that usually only lives, um, it par- it's parasitic on snakes. Um, and they reckon that uh, that this woman, you know, she grew her own veg in the garden or whatever, and, and so had just eaten uh, uh, some of the eggs that had obviously been passed by the snake. Um, she just hadn't washed her veg properly enough and, uh, and had got infected that way. And it's... It, it's a really, really good question, you know, because it, it, one of the fascinating things about uh, anthropology more than archaeology, but when people find the remains, human remains, and they can tell you what parasites maybe they had and what diseases they had from uh, analysing the uh, bones, and you know, you you know, you you are raising a, a, an interesting thing there that you know what people may have suffered from. Uh, from harvesting wild plants, yeah, it's 
pretty grim, really. <laughs> Jez, what are you teetering about now? Prehistoric pirate, Captain Flint. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Should we do save that for an idle moment in the tour bus next week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What do you call a Neolithic pirate, Captain Flint? <laughs> <laughs> Captain Flint was a parrot, wasn't he? Wasn't Captain Flint the parrot? Okay. Discuss. <laughs> oh, should we do something else? <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh, I think we didn't We didn't do this, did we? Uh, I'm sorry, What's you can't that? see what I'm talking about. No, I can't. Get it. What are you together. talking about? I was talking about Neolithic oh, no, necklace. No, we didn't do that. We from didn't Child's that. Grave Reveals Complex Ancient Culture. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? That is it, just it's, astonishing. It's, it really is. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, now, do you know what? There is another example of um, the painstaking, agonising work that people do oh in my the goodness yeah because obviously any of the string or twine or whatever that was uh laced with uh that had long since rotted away and they reconstructed that very very carefully from <coughs> what they could deduce yeah. from how the beads had all fallen apart um in this burial <laughs> that's just yeah. um and they said that it was child's. Um, so that's that's right. Um, uh, and that, oh, the date. Um, um, yeah, we're in Jordan. We're in South Jordan, and where the date is uh, seven thousand four hundred uh, to six thousand eight hundred BC. BC. Yeah, yeah. So just plonk in a nine thousand years old pre-pottery Neolithic. Uh, it's just fantastic discovery yeah. there um <clears throat> i don't know what, um, well, what uh, i mean there's not a huge amount we can say about it other than wow um, um, I, um well um a single accessory you know from that area um i'm just trying to get to the the meat of this so mm. uh, the, the materials in question <clears throat> comprise over 2500 colourful stone and shell, and two exceptional amber beads, the mm. oldest known so far in the Levant. So that's tick ting mm. No, that's, that's a thing. The oldest known amber beads in the Levant, along with a large mm. stone pendant and a de delicately engraved mother-of-pearl ring. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, the, Analyzing the composition, craftsmanship, and spatial layout of these items, the authors conclude that they belong to a single composite, low, multi-row necklace that had since fallen apart. Uh, and as mm. part of the study, the researchers created a physical reconstruction of the original necklace, which is now on display in the Petra uh, Museum in southern Jordan. Um, so this multi-row necklace is one of the oldest and most impressive Neolithic ornaments, providing new insights into funerary practices at the time for individuals of apparently high status. The making of the necklace appears to have been invol involved meticulous work, as well as the import of certain exotic materials from other regions. Now, what I was going to say in relation uh, to this, you know, again, we've been you know, diving about... Uh, the Near and, and Middle East. And exotic though this necklace is, in the context of everything that's been going on from, you know, with the Natufians, because they were not shy of decorating their dead with quite ornate beads and, ne uh, and necklaces and, and things, or headdresses made of beads. And what about mm -hmm. Bonchuklutala? Bon yeah, field of beads, uh, hundred thousand beads. Field of field of beads, um, hundred. You know, yeah. and uh, what's the date on Bonco, Bonco Cluchana? It's before Gobekli Tepe. Yes. Uh, what was <clears> there? <throat> uh, well, the, the roots of it are fourteen thousand. But I don't think the, the beads are that old, are they? The, but the beads are still oh, maybe. Oh, fair, Gobekli fair Tepe. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but <laughs> I still think you're talking about eleven, twelve thousand years. Um, yeah. 
Uh, do you know what astonishes me about things like this is when you're talking about that long ago, you're talking about pre-metal. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is even pre-pottery nearly, I think, let's be honest. Um, so uh, I don't know if any of you folks have ever tried uh, making your own beads, actually drilling a hole through a piece of stone or even a piece oh. of amber that you think, well, amber, that's soft material. It's, you know, fossilized resin. That's not going to be too difficult. You try it. You know, even with a metal tool, you try it. It is not easy. So how long it must have taken to actually make that necklace, mm. I can't imagine. Um, I, you know, I've got a bucket load of amber and I've tried carving it, or, you know, I mean, even just crudely, just trying to make marks in it mm -hmm. and what have you. And mm -hmm. uh, how they would do that pre-metal tools, um, I'm just going um, back to Amazing. the image because, uh, um, oh, it's not included wholly in the picture because the text says um, that um, there is oh. a mother, that bottom bit is a mother of pearl. The impression I'm getting is that that bottom ring is mother of pearl, uh -huh. which is, yeah. Um, so, uh, um, uh, you, Carrie, you and Carrie Ann Chrysler channel. was asking, what was it crafted of, that lower arc? If yeah, I'm getting yeah. this right from the text, then it's actually Mother of Pearl, not clay. clay. Yeah. Yes, you and I are looking at different articles on that, because I've got the whole thing in. Oh, have you? Um, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it uh, it's just because I've got it, uh, um, all the pictures, the, the, te the ads knocked out. Oh, no. And it's knocking out the other pics, but uh, it may well be another um, uh, source that you're looking mm. at. <clears throat> and uh, Neil yes. says, I suspect you're thinking of Baltic amber, but while it's one of the most prolific sources, it's by, by ne no means the only one. I, s I expect we'll probably have to. Uh, uh, well, no re resin everywhere. Um, well, what mm. are you? Are you saying that? Uh, Amber of different periods would be different levels of hardness. That is uh, perfectly true. Is that is that what you're saying? Um, is what who's saying, Rupert? Uh, I, what did you just say to me? You said that somebody had said something about amber. Uh, yeah, um, uh, somebody somebody had said it came uh, from a very long. I can't remember. Not keeping track. It came from a very long way away. And uh, and er Niels said, Eric, I s oh, it's Eric. I suspect you're thinking of Baltic amber, but while it's one of the most prolific sources, it's by no means the only one. Mm. Um, um, <clears throat> I don't think they actually say here, do they? Where it, no, uh, uh, where no it they don't. From, probably. But, uh, you know, that study uh, has probably but, not been... Um, <clears throat> yeah. No. Um, yeah. I believe that's pronounced the, um, the uh, village or wherever it comes from, the... Uh, the 9,000 year old village of uh, Baja. I think that's how it's pronounced, not ba Baja or Baja. No, I think it's not Baja. Spanish. Baja, <laughs> I think. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you finished with that, Rupert? Yeah, I was just uh, ad admiring the picture again. I find that astonishing for 9,000 years old. Yes. Yeah. Stunning. We can't answer your question about uh, whether there's a, a source of um, uh, amber nearer the Levant, though, who, uh, uh, Eric. Uh, I, can't, uh, I don't know. No, but about I, that. I think it's uh, the, the thing with amber, you, you've got to bear in mind that it, it is fossilized uh, resin. Uh, so you, you can find it, you know, all over the world, really. Um, and most of it is it, it tends to be found washed up on beaches. It's, uh, you know there are <clears throat> amber mines in certain places, but mm. but the, uh, but usually it's uh, it, it's when it gets found on beaches that uh, people scoop them up and work with them. So <laughs> it, it could could have been from absolutely anywhere. I have no idea. I have Abby no Sue idea. says. Uh, and, sorry, Rupert. Sorry, I was just going to say odd, odd events. <laughs> Thank you so much. That uh, is is very kind. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, Woo! it's, it's all Thank going you in so the much. funds. You're, yeah, you're brilliant, 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 brilliant. Thank you very much. I was um, going to say to uh, Abby Sue, who's actually sparked a you know a, a, a something in my brain. 
Um, Abby Sue said maybe talk to David Jakes about the tiny tools found at Blick Mead. I think Abby's got, got yeah. a point, actually. Um, mm. Because, uh, you know, what had been happening in the Levant um, w- was certainly with the Natufians. Uh, <coughs> uh, and their changing uh, uh, habits to do with how they were hunting was seems to have been driven by their ability to make make very small and very sharp uh, micro uh, microlithic their technology became microlithic and that's exactly the sort of thing that's going on that uh, with the stuff in blick mead i mean it, it's it's wonderful can, uh, can i can i sort of can we can we have a, a ding for name dropping as well <laughs> not name not dra- name dropping but um uh, you know what I mean. Yes, I, I was lucky enough to be at Blick Mead and I've uh, had the pleasure of, of kneading actual microliths out of the mud in front of me uh, in, the, uh, in the sieving machine, in the sieving uh, basin. It's just an uh, uh, extraordinary thing to, to do that. Um, yeah. uh, and you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I'm sure the, the way they were applying... Uh, microliths you know, to stalks of, or, or shafts and, and things like that that would have been perfectly mm. capable of uh, designing something they, uh, that would efficiently would been, drill. I, I, uh, yeah. But I think the, the, the <clears throat> point remains um, because, you know, for example, there's, there is evidence, I can't remember how far back it goes, but the evidence for dentistry uh, in uh, in the human record goes back a lot further than you think. And there are... Um, there are uh, known uh, specimens where a tooth has been drilled. Um, and there are places in, uh, I think, in the Sahara where these uh, where tiny little drill pieces have been found. You can Google prehistoric drills and you'll see a load. The, the, the thing still remains for me, though, that they must have... I, I don't know how long it would take to make a tool that fine. But they must have got through so many of them in drilling a hole through a piece of amber because it, it's not a five-minute job, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <clears throat> e- even with a metal tool. So, uh, so you know, I can't imagine how many, you you only need to be pushing it with a you know get the angle slightly wrong and it's just going to snap. I have to give a shout out to Kevin, Kevin Murray, who says lovely Hello, stuff. Kev. I think I think in relationship to being at Blick Mead, because it was Kev that uh, caused me to be at Blick Mead. Um, he had the opportunity to book himself onto the, onto the dig, and he invited me to do so at the same time. Or he, he did did it for me. The sad thing was Kevin couldn't turn up on the day. And I was there on my Todd, well, not on my own, obviously, but uh, without uh, without Kevin, he should have been there at the same time. So um, I hope you get a bit of proxy pleasure from uh, my <laughs> uh, yeah finding of the uh, of the microlist there, Kevin. Anyway, shout out for you, mate. Uh, I think uh, was it uh, yeah Stuart said for some reason Lebanese amber springs to mind. And uh, thanks for that, Stuart. It's an interesting thing because I've, I've just looked Ooh, it up. Um, Lebanese amber. Well, okay, talking. cool. And and Lebanese amber um, is uh, it gives a date of uh, of, of well, say one hundred and thirty. What does that say? Um, one hundred and thirty to one hundred and twenty-five million years old is your average for Lebanese amber. Now, your average date for Baltic amber is uh, is about 55 million years. So Lebanese amber is a lot older. And you'd imagine that would mean it would be harder, wouldn't you? Over that period of time? I don't know. I don't know. That's a really interesting thing. That's a note to self. Look it up. Um, All right. Shall yeah. we come forward a little bit in time? Where are we going? We're going to, we are going to Wales. Oh, Welsh Wales. Uh, fell into the trap. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, thank you so much. Hey. You're very nice generous. You thank again. you. 
Yes, it certainly is. Great. We're very lucky. What a nice people. We are. We are. <laughs> said, yeah. uh, anyway, moving on. Um, 2,000 year old gold treasure from Iron Age tribe unearthed by metal detectorists in Wales. Um, which is great because, you know, because we're coming way forward in time than anything we've talked about before uh, tonight. Yeah. So, yeah, not long. Or, when, when did the Romans arrive? <coughs> oh, when did they arrive? Oh, yeah. I don't know. It was, um, when did they have their big bust up with the, um, uh, with the Druids uh, there on Anglesey? <laughs> Uh, oh, that's long after that. they arrived, yeah. The yes, Battle of Menai Bridge. It is yeah. a long time after they arrived, mm -hmm. but uh, but equally, in the grand scheme of things, not that long. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Battle of the Menai Straits, I meant, not the bridge. The bridge wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> no. That would have made no, the job it, a bit different. Know, this, is, this is one of those moments where I could open my mouth and tell you to press that bell half a dozen times because I'm trying yeah, to remember. Yeah, this is ridiculous, isn't it? No, the exact Ooh. date. I, I, threw, I threw a Google, you, you let off. Yeah, 50 AD. Uh, Stuart, that'll do 50 AD. 48 yeah, AD, Elaine, Eric says. Elaine says yeah. 46. 46? I, you know, I, I, mm, I, I think, think 46 right. is probably closer to it because uh, I remember yeah. when we were recording Standing With Stones and we were standing there yeah. where, where they would have been. In the mud. And, and I remember saying 40-something. Well done. <laughs> you remembered, yeah. remembered. Okay. Well, Metal detectorists. Was, uh, yeah. Metal detectorists have discovered a treasure trove of gold coins strewn across an open field in Anglesey, an island in Wales. Hello, an <laughs> island in an island in Wales. Some an people in Anglesey in, will in have Wales, something to say yes. about that. Uh, no, it's think. not an island in Wales. It's uh, an island. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's a large lump of. Wales chipped off at the north uh, <laughs> northwest corner there. Yeah, no, an island in Wales, marking the first time that Iron Age currency has been found in the country. Fifteen well-preserved coins, which were minted sometime between 60 BC and 20 BC, are known as staters and were common currency in ancient Greece. And it's getting a bit confusing now. Uh, the highly stylized coins were derived from the Macedonian gold coins of Philip II, who served as the king of the ancient kingdom of Macedonia, 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 yeah, let's do that, let's go with Macedonia. Macedonia. <laughs> <laughs> And feature the bust of the Greek god Apollo wearing a wreath on the coin's head side and a two-horse chariot and rider on the coin's tail side, according to a statement. Uh, they were likely used by the Coriolatavi uh, tribe, who inhabited the area during the Iron Age. Um, so, the, yeah... Yeah, did I mean? Gee, some that's uh, quite something for a m <clears throat> metal detectorists. That's a, a huge feather in the cap, and of course, going straight to the portable portable antiquities scheme uh, thing. So mm. uh, good on them. Absolutely, um, yes. I mean, we we love it when detectorists uh, do the decent thing mm -hmm. and uh, and report their findings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, Finding the coins from this time period in Wales is incredibly rare because Iron Age tribes in the region normally didn't use outside currency. Based on previous research indicating that the island was an important religious centre from the 1st century BC to the 1st century AD, experts think the coins may have been used as offerings to the gods, accord, offerings to the gods according to the statement see this uh, the odd thing i find you know about this is that what use you know if you've got a currency what use is it in a place where it's not currency if you see what i mean that it's not yeah, been banded yeah. about are you yeah. and if so why have a hoard and bury it on anglesey or you know lose I, it on I, su I suspect that the the answer to that is probably because they're gold and yeah you know, I missed the I mean, bit. The, I missed the, the bit reason, where it yes. says that they were mint. Did I say they were minted somewhere uh, in England? 
that they weren't from Greece. That's a confusing thing, saying the gold coins or the style of the gold coins sort of seem to originate mm. uh, from Greece. But the coins uh, themselves uh, were minted somewhere in England. That's um, interesting in itself. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, da, 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 da. I, I've lost it in the uh, in the text. It's there. I can't see it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, guys. Uh, <clears throat> no, that's all right. But that's the thing, isn't it? That the, the, the fact that they were gold, um, and uh, if uh, they must have had, yeah, uh, true. A, a, a common way of of weighing, you know, what is a, a weight of gold? That you know, there must have been a common exchange of uh, of weights and measures. This is quite late, so there would have been a, 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 a yeah. weights and measures system in place. So I, I suppose it doesn't really matter where the coins came from if well, you know that the implication gold. was that they weren't being used in the way in the <laughs> way for which they were, uh, um, you know, the purpo- they weren't being used in the way for which they were purposed. Uh, is yeah. Thing. But nevertheless, you know, when you take into account uh, that uh, the resources on Anglesey from a metals point of view, particularly the copper mines, amongst other stuff, um, I mean, talking about trade going way, way back, uh, you know, I mean, that's a major reason the Romans, uh, you know, had to uh, go across the Menai Strait anyway and get rid of the Druids to get their hands on the copper mines. It's probably yeah. an economic thing. It wasn't nothing to do. It had nothing against druids per se. They just wanted the copper they, direct. They just they <laughs> just wanted the minerals. That's all they wanted. Um, that's um, yeah. Because if they were going to melt it down and make whatever, you know, you wouldn't really care, would you? What mm. the coin was. I mean, from that point of view, if you just want the raw material, if all you want is gold, then a coin it might as well be an ingot. It's, it's yeah. just you see, Stuart's quite right. It's, it's Lincolnshire. The, those um, uh, coins were minted in Lincolnshire. Right. Which is in the text. I couldn't see it. I don't know if this is a memory problem, but Stuart says I should ring the bell <laughs> for being useless at uh, looking at text. There you go. Yeah, thank, you for the, thank you for that. Lincolnshire. Mm. Okay. Anything more? No, it's just um, it, it's it's a minefield, isn't it? Really, when you start getting into uh, you know, it's a Greek style coin, and it was minted in Lincolnshire. And you think, who are these people? Yeah. Um, so look, shall we move on to another thing? Because it yeah, is yeah. half past nine. Um, the well, if it's half people... past nine, I tell you what, you could do. You yeah. could run an advert, and I'll sort my sound out. <laughs> Well, while you sort your sound sound out, what I was going to yeah. say, I'll introduce the next one while you you, you sort your uh, well. Your I, it sound will out. require me rebooting now because I've tried all the other things and. Uh... Okay, all right. Well, that's probably not too bad an idea, folks. Uh, bear with us. Um, we're going to run an ad. It's an ad for us. It's an ad for Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge, which is Rupert yeah. uh, rightly at the right at the top of the program said you can go any time, Rupert. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Rightly, see you in a minute. <laughs> all right, <laughs> bye. Uh, bye. As as uh, as Rupert rightly said, um, uh, w- yeah, we'll be doing the first bit of filming for Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge in uh, November, uh, all being well. Um, we've raised the funds for that, and thank you for everybody that you know really kindly has donated and uh, and uh, made that um, leg of the filming uh, possible. Uh, we did make a, an ad uh, before that actually happened. It was responsible for, you know, stimulating the interest in, in that. Um, however, the Buy Me A Coffee campaign is, of course, still going because the subsequent parts, probably one, uh, is probably going to be three parts in total. Uh, they're not funded yet, so anything that goes to the um, Buy Me A Coffee campaign now rolls over uh, into those uh, next bits. We don't have a, um, a sort of specific advertisement for <clears throat> our Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge um, uh, venture parts two and three, but uh, bear with us while Rupert uh, gets himself sorted out as we run the uh, 
uh, Gebekli Tepe to Stonehenge promo video. It's only a couple of minutes long. We would like you to help us to take you on an extraordinary journey. We're asking you to help us answer the question of not only how did this amazing monument down here in the south of France come to be, this is the Domaine des Fades near Ciron, but what led to the construction of thousands and thousands of megalithic monuments throughout northwestern Europe and ultimately, at the end of the Neolithic period, Stonehenge, about a thousand miles that way, on the Salisbury Plain. The answer isn't here, nor on Salisbury Plain. And in order to even begin to tell the story of the Neolithic, we need to be somewhere else. And at another time, thousands of years even before this ancient monument was built. And for that, we need to head east. is in helping to tell the story of how, from the earliest farming in Mesopotamia in the Fertile Crescent, humans came to leave their mark on the world in the form of the great tombs, henges and megaliths that we wonder at today. We plan to make a series of films to illustrate that story, and we'd like your help. We need your support to raise the funds necessary to begin filming the series, starting right now with the first episode. Supporting this project is really easy. We have a Buy Me A Coffee webpage where you can make a contribution for as little as $5, or as much as you want. Each and every single dollar raised will go towards the travel and subsistence costs necessary for each stage of filming. You'll find loads more information about our plans and our funding goals on our Buy Me A Coffee website. For the moment, though, it seems that we've come as far as we can. In front of us is the Mediterranean Sea. That way, that way lies Italy, Sardinia, Greece, the Aegean, Turkey, Cyprus, northeast. What have we got northeast? We've got the Great Steppe, we've got the Balkans, up the Danube. Yeah. Ah, good grief. That way. What have we got that way? Uh, well, if we turn right, go that way, turn right, then we go along the bottom part of Spain, of Andalusia, and you know, up then up the Atlantic seaboard, up to Brittany, which leaves only one place left to go, really, isn't it? Going home for us, yes. Yeah, the point is, we're going to have to visit all these places if we're going to stand a chance, any chance at all, of explaining the presence on Salisbury Plain of a set of sarsen stones we call Stonehenge. Yes, yeah, so please donate now and help us to start that journey. We thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were there, and he's gone again now. I'm all on my own again. I thought he'd be back. He was. He was in the green room, and now he's disappeared. Let's just turn that off. Oh, turn it on again. Oh, <clears throat> CL, CL Jeans, thank you so much. That's just absolutely brilliant. Um, thanks for your uh, contribution. Um... <clears throat> Right, um, so I'm waiting on Rupert to come back. Um, I will uh, put me full screen, just uh, so to fill the gap. I'll tell you what, though, the next bit uh, that we were going to talk about is uh, the discovery of um, uh, megalithic dolmens <clears throat> discovered at uh, the La Lentuela. Hello, somebody's knocking at the door. Is it Rupert? It is! Hooray, hooray, hooray! Yeah, I had to do that oh. three times. <laughs> your so and your sound is back, though. <clears throat> Thank goodness for that. Thank goodness yeah. for that. And I've just come back in time to say, well, hey, CL Jeans, thank you so much. That's absolutely brilliant, yeah. <laughs> thank you. 
Um, yeah, I just started to on the title to and, the next and, uh, bit. And Trash Eaters Anonymous. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, You've been so generous tonight. Thank you so much. What do you do? Oh. Fantastic. <laughs> Our oh, cup running over, Rupert. Our cup does. running over, mate. Yeah. It does. <clears throat> Where were you going? Where were you going? Uh, well, I was going to. Um, I was going to just north of Malaga, or Malaga, uh, uh, on the Costa del Sol. You know, mentioned earlier, uh, and the megalithic dolmens there, um, which yes. is nice. And of course, when we're talking about dolmens, we've got to remember that we're in, uh, you know, the sort of more um, continental uh, or uh, way of speaking about dolmens, which is uh, a very different way to the way we talk about dolmens when we're talking usually talking about portal tombs and uh, that that kind of thing. But this, uh, <clears throat> if I I just scroll down to the picture, we're talking about this kind of thing, which is much closer to a sort of uh, a passage tomb uh, or an allée couverte, something like that, um, if I'm mm. not mistaken. Um, mm. which is something very different to what we'd call a, a, a dolmen in reference to something uh, in the British Isles. Uh, yes. But there we are. Uh, there it is. It's uh, very nice and indeed. But interestingly, uh, talking about, you know, north of Malaga, that means we're not far at all from the, in, the monster site of uh, the Dolmen uh, Domingo, which um, mm. we uh, uh, we've included in a, in a piece, that, what was it, 10 astonishing megalithic monuments from around the world that you probably never heard of, or that aren't Gobekli Tepe or, or Stonehenge. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Uh, like a, sn that. a snappy little title. Um. <laughs> yeah. So this, yeah. these uh, dolmens have been found, uh, well, not far, just to the to the west of where uh, the Dolmen de Menga is, which is a, a colossal, you know, it's a dolmen. I tell you what, I think I've got a picture. Yeah. So look, compare and contrast. So that's the inside. That is the inside of the Dolmen de Menga. Okay. Yeah. And there are your... Yeah, Slightly different uh, dolmens. They do look like uh, Allé Couvert, don't they? They really do. They really. Uh, do. Is there anything particular yeah. about Allé Couvert that separate themselves from what we'd know as a passage grave, Rupert? I don't think so. Is there? I mean, it's a rose by any other name, isn't it? They've, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, um, it's a bit like you know when is a when is a dolmen a a portal. Dolmen or a portal tomb, you know. It's um, yeah. Well, talking uh, of which, have you learnt <clears throat> your tomb types for next week uh, in Ireland? Court tombs, that's a very rude, tombs. That's a, that's, a very, that's, a, that's a very rude question to ask me when you know that we've got uh, people watching who are on the tour. No, folks, I haven't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we have it nailed. Really, it's it's fine. Court tombs, wedge tombs, portal tombs, and passage tombs. Those are the four you need to, yeah, uh, get un under your belt. Uh, I do believe, though, that these dolmens are a bit later than uh, the Dolmen de Menga. Uh, Dol Dolmen de Menga, you know, is a great example of a megalithic monument on that side of the Mediterranean. Talking about people coming down across the Mediterranean and down into uh, into Morocco. I mean, Dolmen de Menga uh, on this reckoning, uh, what is it, seven thousand? Uh, um, um, yeah, in the same sort of um, ballpark as far as dates are concerned. Um, but that's it. Um, I can't think of anything else really to, to say there, except that it's huge, you know, that it expands this area uh, above uh, Malaga on the uh, Costa del Sol there um, uh, as, a, as an archaeological, prehistoric archaeological area. I just, <clears throat> I love the fact that, uh, that, that sites of this scale, if you like, are still being found in places where, you know, they've been excavating there for ages. And the fact that they, after however much time they can still find uh, sites as substantial as this, it's, mm, it's quite mm -hmm. impressive. 
as you say, yeah, all right, not on the same scale as El Romoral <clears throat> and Menga and what have you, yeah, but yeah. Um, nevertheless. And we, you know, we're we're lucky. I mean, <clears throat> amongst all uh, uh, many other things, you know, we live in a, a time when so much of this work is is going on, and and we get to reap the benefits and create our you know n narratives and stories uh, about the whole uh, of prehistory. Um, um, and again, it's a question of hats off. You know, there's a guy there. Look, look. That actual work being done, that's it's, it's, it's tough, in, especially when it's hot like that, I expect, um, uh, with, with your trowel on your knees. Um, sun's quite you know. low. Sun's quite low. They've uh, they, they've probably come out. They're working seven o'clock oh, yeah. in the morning. Yeah, fair and, enough. And uh, they'll pack it in at 11. <clears throat> but I was saying to Rupert uh, that um, you only find stuff where you look – or archaeologists only find stuff where they look. And it's no random thing, uh, the decisions that archaeologists have to make about where they're going to look and where they're going to dig. Now, it's, it seems quite a lot of the time these days that being alerted to new stuff by aerial photography, like drone photography and LIDAR and and, uh, and that kind of thing. But there is still a certain amount of, you know, a huge amount of risk and divination about uh, where you're going to put your first uh, trench in, uh, whether you're going to find something uh, or not. You know, it'll never... Or, or, uh, we'll never have all the evidence we ever need to make, to join all the dots. Um, not you know, possible. Not possible. I mean, it seems like we, we've got a lot, you know, we, we have a almost constant stream of new discoveries of this, that and the other. Uh, but, uh, it, it, yeah, it's it really is like looking through a pinhole back at the past, isn't it? That's mm. probably, or through a keyhole, maybe, I don't know. There's only so much we can ever, ever see. The rest is uh, up to us to use our brilliant minds to create uh, stories that actually hold together that explains the past. Brilliant minds, yes. Other adjectives are available. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, it's quite funny. There's a, there's a conversation going on or chat going about on about foot. Fogus. Foot, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, there's David gone. David, because David was tuned oh, no. in at work, so maybe he couldn't hang around. Because if it, if anything was going to make David wait in, it's going to be a Fogu. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the thing is, Fogu's. I mean, it's probably uh, a, um, a a word game thing because I think they're called Fogu's in the in Cornwall, but the general tune term is souterrains. Yes. Uh, and uh, I've seen a souterrain on Orkney, under a brock. Yeah. You know, so. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I may, afraid. I may be talking uh, you know, bollocks there. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, I'm maybe talking not. rubbish there. It, but, it's uh, one of those things. I and I don't want to upset anybody. And this is why. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, David, David, and I have have funny arguments about this because uh, you know uh, David does love a fogo, but um, uh, for me, it's a souterrain, and and there's nothing mysterious about them at all. Um, I yeah. But they, there you go. That, that's just an opinion, and um, you can't claim evidence for anything specifically. So. <clears throat> mm. Mm. Good stuff. We're getting on for um, quarter to ten. I suggest that we make this the last item of the evening, and the yeah. item, and the item being that uh, uh, archaeologists reveal evidence of British festival held. 6,500 years ago. So how did this one get on the list? <laughs> okay. Well, as you ask me that question directly, I have to be honest and say that the reason, because it's just me putting my grouchy hat on again. Um, oh, good. The, the reason I wanted... Yes. <laughs> Well, partly it's fun, uh, you know, that they've got evidence for what they think is a festival. Um, the reason it flagged up for me was because uh, some of you will uh, know, uh, in fact, you might have seen the interview that, or heard the interview we did with Merrin Dinley and her husband, Graham, who have done oh. phenomenal research on prehistoric <laughs> brewing. 
Okay. Um, uh, really interesting research. And then at the uh, the British Museum, the World of Stonehenge exhibition, uh, one of the exhibits there were threshing forks, uh, the forks that are used in the purpose of brewing. And okay. and here in this uh, uh, in this uh, one of the th 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 <laughs> some, <laughs> something that's been found in this excavation are what look very much to me like threshing forks and they're saying that these are tridents that we use for fishing um uh, <laughs> yes you you've gone straight to the um yeah the uh, the, the, the grouchy yeah. grouchy bit there uh, a bit of context uh, though I, for uh, you know good folk we're talking six uh, five um what uh, 4500 bc so yeah, you know, you know these are Mesolithic peoples, but the you know what I got from this was that thing about people coming together from all over the country, um, and these are still hunter gatherers apparently. apparently. Okay, so yeah. you know we're five hundred years before uh, the Neolithic in yeah. Britain. So um, yeah, uh, you know, and all bringing stiff stuff from all over the country to this uh, one place, which is near. Carlisle, which is not far above the Lake District, where the great um, uh, Cumbrian circles are, you know, just for a bit of geographical context. Mm. And we're talking about uh, not that much of a gathering, strangely enough. They're talking about max about 100 people. So I think the, yeah. uh, there's a bit of hyperbole in the, uh, uh, in the title there already. Yeah. Nevertheless, yeah, yeah. the evidence points to people coming from all over the country and bringing stuff from all mm. over the country uh, for seems mm. to be a festival arranged around the seasonal migration of the salmon. Yes. Hence, you know, uh, <laughs> our, well, you know, kind of, well, duh. <laughs> Uh, yeah. they're, they're um associating these um tridents uh, with fishing i think there'll be a lot of fishermen having a good old laugh there well do you know the the crazy thing about this is that they they actually say in the text as well about um uh, netting and fish traps across rivers you you wouldn't need to be using forks to catch fish it's just not what you do um and uh yeah, talk amongst yourself for a second unless you can turn around without removing your headphones and get your hands on the uh world of stonehenge book can you oh world of stonehenge well, that's, oh no, that's right you behind talk, me. i'll do it oh okay <clears throat> uh you, you're gonna you're finding the photograph of uh the actual um, yeah, the cameras, all on you, Rupert. Um, the actual photograph of the tridents in the world of Stonehenge. Yeah, book. yeah threshing forks. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. Here's a picture of the man at work. Wh wh whistle a happy tune. Oh, it's going to take you that long. Okay. Um, well, I'm pretty sure it's not in the index. As, um, oh, sure. Um, cause uh, you also, what... yeah, the other thing to do, I mean, you know, not blowing the fishing thing out of the water because, of course, uh, at the, this location, which is in the River Eden near Carlisle, um, uh, the excavation has been taking place on a small island and what would have been a series of island, islands in, in the river uh, in the Mesolithic. And of course, it's not just from one time. Those uh, trident things are actually from from 500 years later, apparently. As far, ah, here we go. They look like the same ones. Hold on, I'm getting. They do, you, don't I'm, they? I'm putting you. Uh, um, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, they're almost identical. No, not that bottom one. Not not quite, but yeah. uh, but they they do say. Uh, to be fair, in the text, they do say possibly for trapping eels. And they're like, but blah 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 blah, um, mm. uh, and uh, uh, or in agricultural activities as hay forks and uh, mashing forks in the process of beer brewing. Mashing forks. Um, uh, so uh, there you go, and uh, they <clears throat> they are so similar that I just um, I think it's unlikely that they would have been used for catching fish, personally. But yeah. 
Um, there is always, as Kevin says, the possibility there may have been back scratches. But, uh, <clears throat> um, Brendan they says like they look like tines, crawfish uh. tines. Okay. okay. <coughs> barbecue skewers. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I can't remember. They're pretty big, actually, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're, you know, a good size. The, these yeah, pictures the, make them yeah, look a bit on the small size, but what, they're five foot yeah, long? Well, the, yeah, yeah, roughly. Or, uh, five, so six foot the, long? A metre and a half, two metres. Yeah, not quite two metres, I don't think, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... <laughs> I'm not reading all those out. Don't be silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Marshmallow forks, why not? Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, site because uh, uh, they've got evidence for stone arrow manufacture on the site. Found uh, two very large, uh, yeah, the, the tridents are from there. Um, it's impossible to know for sure how many people participated in exploring the spring, spring salmon run and took part in any associated ceremonies and rituals. There are indications of the scale as what have likely to have been an import, important annual event. The flint working debris, over 300,000 fragments. Oh, man. Uh, which poor soul had to sort through those? <laughs> if any, uh, yeah. yeah, this is this is where you, this is the sort of information you need if you're considering a career in archaeology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, f f finding you know eight, ten, ten, twelve microliths in in the mud is a thrill. That's great. But then there's a, <laughs> there's one yeah. or two people that have to process everything that gets found and put yeah. them in plastic bags and make that sure they each bag is written on you know with the context and the date and the, everything uh, and then archived uh, fully yeah it takes a special you know, kind of person do you know something that gets me mm -hmm. about that aspect of the work and that's that obviously back in the day uh line drawings um you know pen and ink tended to be the way that things were recorded yeah uh n now you would think that they would do it all photographically no now they do it as both and uh I, i've helped our, our friend kath walker um when uh, she's working on flint assemblages and I, i've given her a hand putting pages together um where she's she's got line drawings and photographs of flint assemblages you know that, that all these things have to be collated and I, I have called her like you know there might have been weeks in between uh, calls and uh, i'll say how's it going and she'll say still doing flints you know and it's just relentless relentless i can't imagine you know i need a bit of variety in my day <laughs> i just <clears throat> don't think i could cope with yet another piece of flint Hmm. How do you, it how goes do you on to say, excited? sorry, Rupert, what did you say? What were you saying? How do you remain excited by the 250,000th piece of flint? Mm. I don't it's think made. you do remain excited. It is just a job to do in the, you know, <laughs> with your, mm. your uh, PhD, postgraduate study, whatever, you know, <laughs> it's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, getting on for 10 o'clock. Site was mostly in intensely used for a period of some 800 years, apparently. Um, yeah, I said about it probably not being more than 100. I don't know how they work that out, though. Um, they'd somehow, it says, they had acquired volcanic glass, a uh, pitch stone stroke obsidian, from the Isle of Arran, 120 miles away by sea, and from the Yorkshire coast, 100 miles away, cross country, from area, mm. and from areas much nearer the site, such as the Cumbrian Mountains, the North Pennines, the coast, Solway Firth, and Scotland's southern uplands. So this is, that's the thing, that's what it's saying. Hunter-gatherers, yeah. they were well-connected hunter-gatherers. That's all I'm saying, that's were. all we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. 
And yeah. on that bombshell, I think it's um, time to uh, wind up, really, Rupert. We've uh, uh, tested the good people's patience out there. Uh, to we the... have. I, I, I do think we should just have a quick uh, a quick um, uh, hats off to uh, Leon, though, who says, I've just found several kilos <laughs> of flint tools, flint chips, polished axe pieces in four days field work, uh, walking. Wow. Flipping egg. <laughs> What's that going to lead to? Yeah. That's a story for another time, I expect. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Wow. We won't quiz you on where you are and all, all the rest of it, but uh, be fascinated to know. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you can tell us it, next time. Yeah. Um, mm. Cool. Okay, as Rupert was saying, um, thank you all very much indeed for turning out. I have to say, I noticed at several points uh, during this show, I expected it to be fewer viewers than last time, but in actual fact, I think we broke uh, our um, uh, concurrent live viewer number uh, record um, um, this time around at, at, at some point, which is all very, 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 very good. Um, <clears throat> hopefully... When, while we're in Ireland, we'll be able to uh, either do something live or uh, record some stuff and uh, post it up to YouTube. So you won't be uh, mm -hmm. devoid, the, the the channel won't be devoid of content while we're away. We'll do our very best. Can't uh, promise anything, can't make plans because uh, <clears throat> as... Um, you know, we're dependent on uh, contingencies as we as we go, um, but we will still be reporting back uh, one way or another. Yes. Um, so, uh, yes. Final words from yourself, Mister uh, Soskin, whatever your name is. Uh, no, nothing more to add. Just thank you so much. Um, enjoy your company as always. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. I don't know where it'll be from. <laughs> Yeah, we wish you all well. Thanks again. Till the next time. Bye-bye. Take care.